Hi, and welcome to Heart Health with Michelle. Today, I have a really, really exciting guest. It's Dr. A. Wells. She is an MD who specializes in sleep apnea, and we're going to talk about sleep apnea and heart health. In part one, we will discuss how to detect if you have sleep apnea and how to all those prevention strategies. And then in part two, if you have sleep apnea, that's where we will dive into the treatment options and the different modalities that we can work with over there. So before I, we talk about all this, I'd love for Dr. A. Wells to introduce herself, and um, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks, Michelle. I'm really happy to talk to you today. Um, so I'm Audrey Wells, as you said. Uh, I am triple boarded. I have a board certification in sleep medicine, in obesity medicine, and pediatrics, and my main area of uh, uh, medical expertise is with adult sleep medicine. I love it. I love it. So how does somebody know they have sleep apnea, right? I mean, just think about it. The sense that we are, a lot of the symptoms is snoring, but you don't hear yourself snore when you're sleeping. And if you don't have a partner or your partner sleeps in a different room or whatever it might be, how do we know? What are some signs that someone can know that they have sleep apnea? Um, actually, let's, let's take that question pause it for two seconds and let's talk about why is it even important, right? Before we kind of dive into how do we diagnose sleep apnea, I think it's more important to know, well, why do we need to care about sleep apnea? So mm -hmm. let's have our discussion really about what is sleep apnea before we dive into all the little nitty gritty details. Sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> I want to highlight that sleep is so important for health, and it's often underrecognized because culturally there's a lot of reward for sacrificing sleep or working through sleepiness. And so I think historically sleep has been undervalued. But as we learn more and more about what sleep actually does for our bodies, I think it's being more recognized that sleep is a component of good health. Um, for example, it's really good for your brain to flush and cleanse itself at night. It's good for your memories. It's good for your heart and heart health. So all of those things uh, are something that I want to highlight as a reason why you should care. Oh, a hundred percent. And even to bring up that heart connection, because, you know, me and the heart are, are so it's, I always connect everything to heart health. Think about it. When you're awake, you're using your brain and you're using a lot of neuronal activity. So your mm -hmm. body is using a lot of oxygen in mm -hmm. order to work. Um, and if you don't have adequate sleep, your body can't restore itself. So then we create more oxidative stress. And you hear me mm -hmm. talk about oxidative stress in the sense of it causing plaque formation in the arteries, it causing havoc. It actually is related to every chronic condition. It's related to cancer. It's related to heart health. It's related to kidney health. So we need to understand that sleep is vital and we can't just mask it with the sense of, oh, I'll just have more caffeine or coffee to help. We really need to work on optimizing our sleep. Um, we've seen in the research that we're looking at sleep from two standpoints. One is a, a, if we don't have enough of it or if we have too much. So the ideal amount is, you know, seven to eight from a heart health perspective, but mm -hmm. less than six or more than nine increases your risk of a heart attack by over 30%. Um, and the reason being is because our body needs to compensate for this lack of restoration. Um, and so when you talk about oxidative stress, I talk about it from an antioxidant standpoint. Yes, there's so much nutrition we can add in to quench those free radicals, but mm -hmm. Sleep is an antioxidant defense mechanism. And in the lack of it, and the lack of good quality and quantity can impede on a cardiovascular health and really impact all pillars of health, right? If you don't have good sleep, your cortisol levels are elevated, your, which is your stress response. Your hunger and satiety cues don't work as effectively. So there's so many things going on when we don't have adequate sleep and we need to address it. I mean, I've also seen in my practice where people have a really high blood pressure in the morning and they're, mm -hmm. they're eating perfectly. And like, Michelle, I don't understand why. And I'm like, you need to get tested for sleep apnea. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's so important that people understand what's happening 
when someone has sleep apnea. So I'd love for you to kind of talk about that. What is going on when someone has sleep apnea and why mm-hmm. does that increase blood pressure and cause this, this issue in our, in our body? Yeah. So some people are surprised to learn that not getting enough sleep or not getting high quality sleep gives your, uh, your body and your physiological systems an inflammatory state. It is very simple and it's a generalized inflammation. We're talking uh, inflammatory cells and cytokines that are sort of aggravated by that sleep problem, whether it's uh, sleep deprivation or a problem like sleep apnea. And so when you add somebody who's got some heart issues in that mix, they're not understanding that sleep is actually a medicine for their condition. Uh, So when you think about sleep apnea, the uh, main thing that causes um, the inflammatory state is this drop in blood oxygen and then reoxygenation. Now, why does that drop in blood oxygen occur? It occurs because the airway in obstructive sleep apnea is collapsing during sleep. And snoring is a marker for that. So the snoring means your airway is narrowed. And so the air that's moving through that narrowed airway causes the tissues to vibrate, kind of like when you let the air out of a balloon. Now, snoring is not always present in sleep apnea. And I I wanna highlight that because there's kind of this idea that I don't snore, therefore I can't have sleep apnea. Well, it's possible that you don't snore and you still have sleep apnea because your airway is closing completely. There's no air movement there. And that's a scary thing. The other situation that you uh, referred to before is that there may be no opportunity to observe the snoring or the pauses in breathing that go with sleep apnea. So bed partner is asleep or there's no bed partner available. They're sleeping in a different room or whatever. Um, So I think the snoring question is helpful if it's present, but when it's absent, you really need to look at other symptoms. So one one thing that occurs sometimes is waking up gasping or waking up with a fast heart rate. That fast heart rate is a reflexive response to your blood oxygen level going down when you've got that airway obstruction. Another indicator is waking up and feeling like you're not rested. Um, And sometimes people recognize lots of awakenings throughout the night. Sometimes they just wake up feeling unrefreshed and kind of crummy. And so it's harder to get through your day. There is a blind spot when it comes to sleep because you're unconscious. And so until you do a sleep study, you actually don't know for sure whether you have sleep apnea. And that's one of the most important reasons to do a sleep study. Uh, The other thing is the sleep study can tell you how severe uh, a sleep apnea condition is if that's present. Yeah, you've muted all of a sudden. I'm good now. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, Um, No, and I think that that's so important because we often say, oh, well, I don't snore. I don't have sleep apnea. And that's kind of that main main marker. I also find that a lot of people have atrial fibrillation and they say, you know, Mm -hmm. my AFib episodes happen when I'm sleeping and it could, you know, that's a big marker of, well, have you assessed for sleep apnea? Um, so, so to kind of summarize in terms of if someone doesn't snore, they should still be looking out for if they're feeling, you know, tired when they wake up, if Mm -hmm. they have like a dry mouth, or if they're feeling like, you know, their, their mouth is, is dry for some reason, that could also be a sign of sleep apnea. Um, so, and if that happens, what, what's the next line of treatment, what should they be doing? Yeah, so I think that just coming into awareness that sleep apnea could be a possibility is a big step. And for some people with heart conditions, especially AFib, you, I would also add that if you're not, um, if you're not having improvement with medication or with procedures like cardioversion, then even testing for sleep apnea in the absence of symptoms is something to consider. And that's routinely something that I get, uh, consultations about, you know, people who had a cardioversion and then they revert back into AFib, they need to come see a sleep specialist to make sure they don't have something else going on. If a person wants to be evaluated uh, for 
a problem with uh, their sleep, then I think the next step is to go to um, uh, a local sleep specialist that's at an accredited center for sleep apnea or sleep conditions, and they can find a center near them by going to sleepeducation.org and typing in the zip code. I think it's really important to find an accredited center which adheres to standards for testing and treatment, and that website will get them to the right place. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my clients will say to me, I don't really want to go into a sleep study and like, I'm not going to sleep well there anyway. So how accurate is it? Mm -hmm. Um, So can you kind of talk about the sleep apnea different options? So I, you know, I know you mentioned the accredited, but some people will do home sleep tests. Are they as accurate to detect sleep apnea? They are actually not as accurate. Um, And I'm glad you asked because it's a really common question. Um, During the pandemic, there was a a big movement to do more home sleep apnea testing, which was appropriate. I want to point out that home sleep apnea testing is only testing for sleep apnea, whereas an in-lab study is a more comprehensive test. So depending on your symptoms, you may be more appropriate for a comprehensive test or the home sleep apnea test. And it would come from an accredited center where your doctor would be interpreting that. The home sleep apnea test does have the potential to underestimate the degree of sleep apnea or even come back with a false negative result. So for a person who has a lot of symptoms, a negative result on a home sleep apnea test should prompt a deeper look with the in-lab sleep study. To answer your question about the quality of sleep that you get in an in-lab sleep study, I'm gonna be totally honest. Yeah, it's different. (laughs) It's different just like if you went to a hotel, you're having sensors applied to your body. Nothing hurts, but it's a little strange for sure. Um, The advantage though is in the sleep lab, I can see exactly objectively when a person falls asleep and when they're awake. So I can factor out all of the wakefulness and just look at their sleep block. And I don't need eight hours of sleep to make a good diagnosis. So we keep people overnight, so we're not turning them out at two o'clock in the morning, but um, it is a deeper look and objectively, it's a more accurate test. Not everybody needs that though. Uh, So I think that when you have an initial visit with a sleep clinic, that's gonna look at a person's whole history and symptoms, that's a decision that's made between them and their sleep specialist. I love it. That's great. Um, I think one thing that's super important to also emphasize, and I hear this a lot with my clients is, you know, my doctor told me if I lose weight, then my sleep apnea will go away. And Mm -hmm. I always say, well, we need to treat your sleep apnea. And then, you know, you can't choose one or one because sleep apnea can actually impede on your weight loss goals as well. So I always like to well, I want to talk about it with in two different realms with you. One is, you know, how do we, how does that, how does that look? Like, is there a truth? If someone's overweight, should they just lose weight and then not deal with sleep apnea? How do we deal with that? And then secondly, does it only affect people who are overweight? Can someone who's thin have sleep apnea? Cause that's also a major like myth in the, in the medical community. And I want to debunk both of those today as well. Yeah, you're exactly right. So um, to the second question about if you are not overweight, can you still have sleep apnea? Yes, absolutely. In fact, 20 to 25% of people who are diagnosed with sleep apnea have a normal BMI because it's more than just about weight. It's about your anatomy. It's about your neurorespiratory control mechanisms. And, you know, sometimes um, I think that people have delays in their recognition of sleep apnea because they fail to recognize that just because you're not overweight, it doesn't protect you from sleep apnea. So I tend to look more at the symptoms and the effect of sleep disruption when it comes to that. 
Excellent. And, I've, and, and I think that that's a big part in heart health in general. I've yes. seen a lot of my clients have a heart attack and they say, my doctor has always dismissed my health, my metabolic health because I was thin. And I was like, yes. that's just one small risk factor. You can, yeah. heart disease doesn't discriminate between your, your weight or your shape size. If you are underweight, overweight, normal weight, you can still have heart disease. You can still have sleep apnea. You can still have chronic conditions. So we need to make sure that people are more aware of those symptoms symptoms and ensure that they're looking at the whole picture and not just their weight. Cause I see that all the time, especially from cardiologists dismissing them. And I'm like, you've had familiar hypercholesterolemia for your entire life. And nobody has said anything because you're thin. Um, mm -hmm. I can't diagnose, but I can tell because of my experience of there's other things going on. So just because you're thin does not mean that you get exempt from sleep apnea and all these other issues. So I'm so glad you, you pointed that out. Yeah, and, and I want to say too that um, women present differently with sleep apnea. And there's a parallel there, I think, with cardiologists and, and heart attack uh, scenarios. Women don't necessarily snore a lot and feel sleepy. They're more like tired and snore a little bit. So, you know, I think it takes a careful eye to kind of survey your patient population and be able to pick out red flags where someone needs more evaluation. Well, speaking to that, then do you feel like if someone wanted to be extra proactive, they're not sure they're tired, but they're not sure what's going on to get mm -hmm. a sleep study. Like, do you feel like it's that preventative thing that most people should be doing? I don't think there's a problem with that at all, because more than likely in the course of the sleep evaluation, you're going to learn something that's going to help you sleep better. So you're exposed to a lot of education that could help you anyway. And the truth is for anybody who, have, who has heart disease, and we're talking problems with cardiac arrhythmias, problems with blood pressure, multiple medications, heart attack or heart attack risk, having the possibility that there's something going on with your sleep and your mind is only going to benefit your health. So I would encourage people to actually have a relatively low threshold to get tested. To that end, um, I've actually outlined some of these uh, ideas and, and red flags on um, a two-page document that I'd like to include for your viewers. Oh, thank you so much. How do they get that viewer? How do they get that um, packet? Yeah, um, I think if we can put a link to uh, the website where they can download it uh, in your uh, show, show notes. notes. Okay, yeah, great. we can do it that way. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I want to circle back to your question about weight loss and uh, sleep apnea. So um, there is, yes, a chance that you could improve or resolve your sleep apnea with weight loss. But your uh, point about having treatment for your sleep apnea first is really insightful. So there's multiple ways that your weight loss is going to be impeded if you don't treat your sleep apnea. And we're talking hormones, we're talking energy, we're talking even thermal reg regulation and stress. So um, for anybody who comes to me with an elevated BMI and they have sleep apnea, um, that's one of the more common questions. And I wish I had a crystal ball to answer it for everybody. But the truth is, if you use weight loss as a health measure, you're gonna be headed in the right direction anyway. So if it cures your sleep apnea or even improves it so that more treatment options open up for you, that's gravy. Right. Well, I also say, I think it goes hand in hand. We need to treat both of them, but a lot mm -hmm. of times people can get off of treatment when they do lose lose weight. Um, but we first need to make sure that we're treating sleep apnea because it can stall and prevent weight loss as well. Remember if there's inflammation, if you have sleep apnea and there's chronic inflammation in your body and now your sleep isn't, isn't well, isn't good, isn't optimal, your cortisol levels are going to be high, which is going to impede mm -hmm. on your body's ability to lose weight. There's a lot of things going on. So if we can address sleep apnea and you you lose weight, you get to your goal, you maintain it more than likely a lot of times you get off 
off your sleep apnea, you know, treatment. And I think that's important to note too. So I always say, let's start with it because it's an important piece of the puzzle. It can prevent weight loss. Um, and then once we achieve your goals, you can get reevaluated to see mm -hmm. the, the differences and what we need to adjust in medication or, or, or treatment or obviously decrease it altogether. So we, it's not, a lot of times people think that if they're on sleep apnea treatment, they're on it for life. And some people might be, but I also think there's that other inter other ability to say, okay, well, let's get reevaluated and see how we're mm -hmm. doing. The reevaluation re piece is so important. Uh, I find that some people just look for improved symptoms and then decide they're not going to treat their sleep apnea anymore. But because it's a multifactorial disease process, it's really important to check again because you don't want to go backwards and regain the weight that you lost because you've stopped treating your sleep apnea prematurely. Exactly. I love that. And I think a lot of times you think of it, sleep apnea, as one of those things you get diagnosed once and that's it. And I think the reevaluation is such an important piece that so many people don't talk about, don't think about, like it's an important piece of the puzzle and you should be getting reevaluated. Is there a standard? I know everybody is different and, and personalization is so important in all aspects of health, but is there like a, a standard of, you know, we, we like our patients to come back every six months or a year to check on how their sleep is. And is that reevaluation test the similar to the first test or is it slightly different? Yeah, so typically if people are, uh, if a person is stable on their sleep apnea treatment, then following up with the sleep specialist every year, year or two is perfectly fine. Of course, I would wanna see them earlier if there's a major change to their health condition, major weight gain or weight loss, and we're talking about 10% of their uh, weight at diagnosis. Um, or if they start having trouble with their sleep apnea treatment, uh, so trouble with their CPAP machine, oral appliance therapy, et cetera, they're having trouble with that and they're not getting the effect that they had before, then they need to come back and get reevaluated. The testing um, oftentimes is the same as what they uh, initially had, but I think that because home sleep apnea testing is so much more available at this point, that's a reasonable option if you've had weight loss of 10% and you want to get retested. A home sleep apnea test does make some sense. Awesome. Awesome. This was great. I think this really leads into our part two, where we'll talk about the different treatments and the different modalities. So um, I'm going to thank all the viewers for watching. I'm going to thank you so much for this awesome part one series. Um, and we'll see you in part two. But any any wisdom, any words, anything you want to give the, the viewers or, you know, how can people find you? Please, please tell us. Yeah, so um, people can find me at supersleepmd.com. Uh, I am starting group courses uh, and classes where I'm uh, talking with people in a group visit to understand sleep apnea better and also uh, how they're being treated. Uh, I'm really passionate about this. I hope that it's helpful for folks and um, there's ways to get in touch with me through the website. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and stay tuned for part two.